I'd like to read a passage today it's in Psalms 33, verses 8 through 15. If you have your pew Bible, it's on page 870. These words are mighty. I, I pray that God would anoint our, our hearts and our minds with these words to remember them. And it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. May God bless his word. Last week I began a series of sermons on the attributes of God, and we took a general overview of the very being of God and all that that entails, and stating that really the attributes of God have to do with one another. That's because all that God is, is infinite, it is eternal, and it's unchangeable or immutable. The words that we use theologically to describe those things is he is omnipresent, he's present everywhere at all times. He is omniscient, he's all-knowing. And he is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. Today I'd like to start narrowing down the subject matter and talk more specifically about the, the individual attributes of God, keeping in mind that each attribute is closely associated with others. So today we will look at the wisdom of God. And in doing that, it's probably best to define wisdom, at least from our point of view. And then we need to see how God's wisdom is different from our wisdom. Now, most everyone distinguishes between a wise person and someone who is merely knowledgeable. I mean, you can know a lot of things and not be wise, but a wise person is one who is able to apply what he knows to life. The book of Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All the knowledge that you really need to have to begin to be wise is that the Lord God is someone you need to respect. Uh, the fear of the Lord doesn't necessarily mean to be afraid of God, but you must know that he is someone that you need to back down from when you go head to head. Uh, my next door neighbor growing up was the star tackle on the high school football team. But I knew him since he was eight years old and just a little kid, but it turned out uh, that he was a pretty big guy, one year older than I was. I wasn't afraid of him. He was a nice guy and we got along great. But one day a group of us were playing basketball in the driveway and uh, things got a little intense as they sometimes do and I got kind of mad and I threw the ball at this guy. And uh, as soon as I saw the look in his eyes, <laughs> I put my hands up and said, okay, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> we were good friends, but he was one guy I did not want to tangle with. That's why I say that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you can understand that God can crush you in one second with one word, then you can begin to be wise. But of course, that knowledge is just the beginning of wisdom. The more knowledge you have, then the more that you have to be able to apply to life. And so knowledge is a very important part of wisdom. The Greek word gnosis, from which we get our word knowledge, signifies something more than just fact knowledge, but experiential knowledge. It's used in the terms of, of knowing a person as opposed to just knowing certain facts. I looked up wisdom in the dictionary, and Webster's defines wisdom as the ability to deal sagaciously with the facts. Then I had to look up sagaciously, because I didn't know what that meant. <sighs> and that means keen in scenting, as if in, in smelling something out. And I like that analogy. Wisdom is the knowledge of something that you can't quite put your finger on, yet you know it's there. You can't touch it, you can't see it, but you can sense it. It's, it's kind of like a mystery. The wisdom of God is also described to us as a mystery. Let's look at a, a couple of verses that describe it in that way. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with verse 6. It says, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden, 
and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. Keeping that in mind, let's look also at Colossians chapter 2, starting with verse 2. It says, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In these verses, we can see some key differences between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. One difference is that whatever wisdom man has, he must somehow acquire. And man can acquire wisdom. You know, he can do so in different ways by just analysis of a situation. You know, we can break down all the aspects of a situation into small parts and evaluate them and determine cause and effect. And, and therefore, we can say that we know something, that we've learned something. Or maybe just by induction, where we start with some assumed premises and we draw some logical conclusions and therefore we can say that we are certain about something. But the wisdom of God is not something that he achieved or acquired or was given. The wisdom of God is just the essence of who he is. It's a natural attribute. God is wisdom. And so when we abide in him and he in us, then that godly wisdom can become a part of who we are. God can reveal things to us just by His Spirit, as we read. But any wisdom we have, whether it's God's wisdom or man's, we must get from somewhere else. So with this in mind, let me read another definition of wisdom by J.C. Clark, who says that wisdom implies two things. Number one, the choice of the highest end. And number two, the choice of the best means to secure that end. In other words, wisdom involves choices. You can tell who is wise by the choices he makes. And you can tell someone who's not wise by the choices that person makes. The wise person has the ability to pick out of all the alternatives the very best way that a situation could turn out. And that's not easy to do. Also, the wise person picks out the best ways out of all the options out there to make that best choice happen. It takes a wise and a knowledgeable person to scent out, to sniff out this, this mystery. Well, God, in his innate, natural wisdom, did just that. He picked out the very best possible solution to the world's biggest problem, the problem of our sin. He chose the loftiest goal, that sin be ultimately punished, that justice be done, that the power of darkness be ultimately destroyed, and that each and every one of us be given the opportunity to be rescued from the pit of destruction into which we've placed ourselves. There can't be any more noble or honorable goal. God also chose the very best possible ways to secure that goal by, first of all, giving us the law so that we could see how sinful we are, by sending prophets to point us back to God and to the coming Savior, by emptying himself and giving his son Jesus to take all of uh, the punishment of our sins upon himself so that we could be free from the weight of the world. And then he sent his Holy Spirit to indwell us and to empower us so that we can live for him and begin to jump into that task of defeating sin and Satan in our lives. So everything God has done, everything that he said, everything that he has allowed to happen has been and still is geared toward securing his goal. God is able to do that and we can be confident in his wisdom. God knows what he's doing. Even though we don't understand it, when we look around us and it really seems sometimes like Satan is winning and that God's plan has just been messed up. Did you ever feel that way? Oh, God had a plan, but now it's all messed up. Don't believe it. God is in control. We can know that because the Bible tells us certain things about God's wisdom. And the things that we discussed last week about who God is, we can also say about his wisdom. First of all, God's wisdom is infinite. Psalms 147.5 says, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit, or it is infinite. We said last week that infinity means beyond measure. So in terms of quantity, we can't just picture the amount of God's wisdom. It's impossible. 
But in terms of quality, we can at least understand that God knows everything there is to know about everything. He knows his inanimate creation. Verse 4 of Psalm 147 says that he has the stars counted and he knows them by name. Every star out there, he knows. He's even identified it. He knows every flower petal. He knows every bird in the sky. Matthew 10, 29 says that a sparrow does not fall to the ground without God knowing about it. And he knows us. He knows everything we do. He knows everything we say. He knows everything we think. He knows who we are deep inside. He knows what we want. He knows what we need. He knows us so well. He knows the very hairs of our head. I know for some of us it doesn't seem like a big deal, but for most of us that's an incredible thing. God knows everything. And every bit of his knowledge is applied to secure his highest end, his highest goal. Everything he has done is a result of his ultimate wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved. It's the power of God. It's the wisdom of God. God's wisdom is infinite. God's wisdom is also eternal. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to turn with me, or you can look on the screen. I'd like to look at Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 11. It says, Remember this. Fix it in mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I have, made, I have known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, My purpose will stand. And I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey. From a far off land a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that will I bring about. What I have planned, that will I do. Everything that God does in his wisdom is geared toward accomplishing his purpose. Namely, the salvation of his people and, and victory over sin and death. From the very beginning to the very end, this is what God has in mind. From before the beginning and after the end, this is God's purpose. Because God is eternal, there is no beginning or end with Him. The passage that Ken read for us clarifies for us that, that further. Now, just look at those again in Psalm 33, 11. It says, But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of His heart through all generations. Verse 13 goes on to say, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. See, God transcends our framework of time and space. That, that's what eternity means. God knows the future. God knows the past. He knows everything we ever did. He knows everything that we ever will do. So does that mean that then we are, are locked into a fate, uh, a predetermined destiny, and we really don't have any free choice? No, not at all. That's because God is not locked into our box of time and space. He just knows everything, past and future, because that's who he is. A.H. Strong puts it this way, the future free actions of men do not take place because they are foreseen. They are foreseen because they are to take place. In other words, God didn't write down on a tablet a million years ago that on September 14th, 2014, that each of you would be sitting here in this sanctuary on the corner of Burkhart and Spinning in Dayton, Ohio. But yet, he knew that you would be. It is that God sees time as a whole, and his wisdom is based on that knowledge of eternity. Now, we tend to think of things in terms of separate single events rather than as a whole. But if we could see things as a whole, it would change our perspective. Think of it this way. I know that there are some golfers out there. I've played with some of you. If you know anything about playing golf, then you know that there are a dozen or so things that you try to remember before you hit the silly ball. But if you start thinking about each of the individual things, you know, you gotta keep your knees bent, you gotta keep your elbows straight, you gotta have a slow, smooth backswing, you gotta keep your eye on the ball, you gotta keep your head down got to be sure to follow through. If you're thinking about each and every one of those individual things, you're probably just going to duff the ball off the tee or hit it into the cornfield, which is what I usually do. 
But if you are practiced to the point of thinking of it all as just one fluid motion, one single motion, instead of all the individual parts, then you're much more likely to get off a good shot. Happens at least once a round for me. <laughs> Sometimes twice. You know. God looks at us. He looks at our lives. He looks at our past, our present, and our future as a whole. Doesn't mean that he isn't aware of the individual parts and the sequence of events. You can know that God is aware of and he cares about every little detail in your life. Psalm 56, 8 says, Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Not, not one of your tears has fallen to the ground without God knowing about it. Not one of your problems has gone unnoticed by your Heavenly Father. But I am glad that God's wisdom is eternal and that He can see things as a whole and not just the individual parts. Well, half the time I don't even know what God is doing. I can know that everything He is doing is working together for my good with the highest of all possible goals in mind. And I can trust Him because His wisdom is eternal and his knowledge is infinite and he is applying that knowledge so that I may know him and that I can be his child. And then thirdly, God's wisdom is immutable. It does not change. That which he knows does not change and the various methods that he uses to accomplish his purposes do not change. A problem that many people have with this idea is in the area of prayer. Is there really such a thing as answered prayer since God knows what is best for us already before we can even think to pray? Or are we just fooling ourselves to think that we can spontaneously go to God in prayer and believe that He's going to actually answer our requests? Well, Scripture is very clear that God invites us to bring our petitions before Him. Philippians 4, 6 says, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. But if God already knows what is best in His infinite and eternal wisdom, what is it that makes us think that He's actually answering our prayers? Well, even in our limited knowledge and wisdom, we can see how it's possible for, let's say, a parent to anticipate the petition of his or her children. Now, when our kids were little, they would often ask for juice to drink. And so Colleen would have the juice already made and, and ready in their little sippy cups sitting in the refrigerator for when they would ask. You know, moms just seem to know about these things. Remember the little sippy cups? You know? <laughs> Sorry, an empty nest moment there. You know? <laughs> if a child is, is sick and fevered, a parent knows that there's going to be a cry in the night. And that parent will be there to respond to that cry, to give the child what he needs, whether it's medicine or a drink of water or just a comforting touch. Well, God, in all his wisdom, knows what we need before we ask him. But when we cry in the night, he will come to us and he will respond to us and he will answer our prayer. J. Oliver Buswell puts it this way, God has anticipated our prayers before the foundation of the world. He has built the answer to our prayers into the very structure of the universe. He knows that we will pray and that we will pray in a spontaneous manner as a child cries to his father. God has put the universe together on a principle of personal relationships in which he answers prayer. And we can, in a measure, understand his loving provision only on the basis of his omniscience. Because God knows everything, we can pray to him and he will answer our prayers. If you're a Christian, please know that God's purpose is to continue to develop that new nature that He has placed within you and created within you when you were born again. It's His wisdom that makes it possible. So don't get caught in the trap of, of depending on your own wisdom and your own knowledge, but to allow the very wisdom of God to shape and to mold your life. As Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you really can't call yourself a Christian, you need to know that God is all wise and that He loves you. He wants you to be a part of His plan of salvation. He knows whether you ever will choose to be His disciple or not. Yet the choice is still yours. I ask you to choose Him today. He provided a bridge for you to come to Him, and that bridge is Jesus Christ, 
who took the punishment for your sin when he died on the cross. And so you've been freed. All you have to do is to accept that freedom and to receive Jesus as your own personal Savior. So as we close this morning of looking at the wisdom of God, the wisest thing that you could ever do is to accept his wisdom, to accept his plan to save you from your sin. 